Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. This is the third time I've been to Hong Kong. The other two times was in uh, May, June, so it's a little more humid and a little more rainy, so I really appreciate the weather now. Uh, this is the first time I've attended the Ovarian Club, but I've been receiving the emails from the Ovarian Club actually for several years, and I've always been impressed with the um, pioneers who have been speakers, but also with the provocative titles uh, of the talks, and I always thought, well, that's a meeting that I would like to attend. So I'm grateful to Dr. Leung and the other organizers for the opportunity to be here today. So uh, the speakers yesterday did an excellent job of introducing the topics of stem cells and spermatogenesis as well as fertility preservation, and my talk will also be on those two topics, which means I can dispense with some of the introductory slides. But I do want to start out uh, just a minute by showing you the anatomy of the testis because it's relevant to how we might implement stem cell therapies in the future. So as you know, the testis, and I hope my arrows work here, but as you know, the testis is made up of a bunch of seminiferous tubules where each seminiferous tubule both begin, each seminiferous tubule both begins and ends in this structure here called the reedy testis. So sperm are produced inside the tubules, they flow out into the reedy testis space and then into the epididymis where they become more mature and learn how to swim. Um, now the reason I take just a minute to show you the anatomy of the testis is because that reedy testis space is the space that we access when we want to infuse stem cells or therapeutics into the testis because by infusing a solution in that space, we can simultaneously infuse the same solution into all seminiferous tubules of the testis at the same time. So I won't go into the details about stem cells and spermatogenesis because you've already heard that, but the undifferentiated spermatogonia, including the stem cells, are located down here along the basement membrane of the seminiferous tubules. And then as th those cells enter meiosis, they move progressively further away from the basement membrane until eventually they release terminally differentiated sperm into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. And if all of this process works correctly, then a man uh, will produce uh, millions of sperm every day uh, and some number over 40 million sperm per ejaculate. But we know that it doesn't work correctly all the time because a full 1% of the global population uh, is azoospermic, which means they aren't producing any sperm in their ejaculate. And one of the uh, situations that can lead to azoospermia are chemotherapy or radiation treatments for cancer or for other conditions. So for that reason, many of our learned societies uh, advise that all patients uh, should be advised about the impacts of their medical treatments on their future fertility and also about options for preserving their fertility. And as you know, for adult patients, those options include, but are not limited to, cryopreserving eggs, cryopreserving sperm, or cryopreserving embryos uh, that occur when sperm meet eggs in a Petri dish. But unfortunately, these options are not available to prepubertal patients because they're not yet producing mature eggs or mature sperm. And this is a significant human health concern because the five-year survival rate for kids with cancer is now over 85%. So what that means is that we're producing a lot of survivors who still have their entire reproductive life in front of them. And for many of those kids, they may not be thinking about the family that they might want to have in the future, but maybe that's something that we as a medical and research community can help them to think about uh, at those early stages in their life. Well, focusing specifically on the boys, we know that even though they aren't producing sperm, they do have the spermatogonial stem cells in their testes that are poised to begin producing sperm at the time of puberty. And for that reason, uh, centers around the world are cryopreserving testicular tissues for boys, also ovarian tissues for girls, because uh, we anticipate that experimental therapies that are currently in the research pipeline might emerge and be available to them in the future. So in 2011, our center established what we call the Fertility Preservation Program in Pittsburgh. Uh, this was a multidisciplinary effort that included the oncologists and the fertility doctors, of course, but also researchers and ethicists, our administrators, where collectively we decided that it was reasonable to perform surgery uh, to collect testicular tissues or, ovari or ovarian tissues from young patients, uh, specifically for those patients who were considered to be at significant risk of infertility. And since that time, we've frozen testicular tissues for 192 boys, and we've frozen ovarian tissues for 39 girls. 
Now, the discrepancy isn't because we like boys more than we like girls, but rather because the uh, surgery to obtain ovarian tissue is a little bit more invasive than the surgery to obtain testicular tissue, but also because we've establ established um, a coordinated network of recruiting sites uh, that are indicated by the blue stars on this map. So the yellow star is our site in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have patients who have traveled all over the world to Pittsburgh to get access to this experimental testicular tissue freezing procedure. Um, but one of, the, one of the challenges of that is that oftentimes a family with a sick kid is unable to get on the plane and travel to Pittsburgh. And so in order to bring the testicular tissue freezing technology closer to the patients, we started to, uh, de developing collaborations with sites around the world, and those are indicated by the blue stars and by the green stars. So when we process the testicular tissue, we do it in the way that's shown in this slide, and that is that we take the biopsy material and we cut it up into small pieces or small cubes that measure somewhere between two to four millimeters cubed, uh, uh, sorry, two to four millimeters per uh, dimension, so nine to 20 milli millimeters cubed. And we cryopreserve the tissue in a uh, basic uh, DMSO and serum uh, containing medium, and we use controlled slow rate freezing. Uh, we've tried vitrification, but at least to date, uh, we can't, um, uh, we've decided the slow rate freezing leads to a better recovery of functional stem cells, so that's our preferred method. And the reason that we preserve intact pieces of tissue is because downstream that preserves the options both for cell-based therapies and for tissue-based therapies, and I'll tell you about one example of each of those today. So. This slide represents the options that are in the research pipeline to preserve the fertility of males. And of course, the first option on the top line is to cryopreserve a semen sample, if at all possible. Surprisingly, we fail to do that more often than you would think uh, because we simply don't do a good job of counseling patients that the treatment that they're going to get could cause them to become infertile and therefore we fail to tell them that the only thing they have to do is to save a semen sample in order to preserve their fertility. As I indicated, this is not uh, possible for prepubertal children, and so what we do is we cryopreserve testicular tissues, and in the future, we can imagine uh, both cell-based therapies and tissue-based therapies that might be used to produce sperm, either by regenerating spermatogenesis in the testis or by uh, producing sperm that would be used in the IVF laboratory uh, by intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And someday, we may actually be able to take uh, somatic cells, for example, from a skin biopsy, and turn those cells uh, into induced pluripotent stem cells and then primordial germ cell-like cells that either can be differentiated into a terminally differentiated gamete, an egg or a sperm, in a Petri dish, or uh, transplanted back into the body to regenerate spermatogenesis in the case of the males. So that may sound a little bit like science fiction, but I think it's important to understand that every method that's shown on this slide has led to fertilization competent sperm uh, that could fertilize an egg and make an embryo and also produce a live-born baby in at least one species. And in the case of skin-derived sperm, uh, that species was a mouse. Of course, if that occurs, what that means is that we won't have to collect testicular biopsies before the initiation of treatment because we can wait until the patient is a survivor and ready to start their family and use somatic cells to produce their gametes. So today I'm going to focus on two technologies on this slide that I consider to be uh, quite mature and I think ready for translation to the human clinic or close to it, so I'll try to provide you the evidence for that. So the first uh, method I want to talk about is spermatogonial stem cell transplantation. Uh, now this is a method, as you've already heard, uh, that was described all the way back in 1994 by Ralph Brinster's group where uh, donor stem cells can be transplanted into the testis of a recipient animal where they regenerate complete spermatogenesis and produce sperm and produce live-born babies. So to ask whether that method might be applicable in the case of, of a young cancer patient, we produced what we call the monkey model of cancer survivorship. And we did this uh, when Brian Herman was a postdoc in the laboratory, and so he was the lead on these uh, experiments. And what we did is we treated rhesus macaques uh, with an alkylating chemotherapy that we knew would cause infertility. But before we did that, we took a biopsy of the testis and cryopreserved either testicular tissues or a testicular cell suspension. In those days, we were usually doing cell suspensions. And then after the therapy, we collected semen every week so that we could determine that the therapy actually led to infertility. And the results of that experiment are shown here. So these are sperm counts uh, from animals that were treated with various doses of chemotherapy that you can see here on the right. Uh, 
And what we learned is that compared to the control animals, which were shown in green, all doses of chemotherapy caused sperm counts to go down to zero or near to zero. The animals that got the lowest dose are shown in red, and you can see that spermatogenesis eventually came back in those animals. And that, of course, is because some of the stem cells survived the initial therapy, and over time they regenerated spermatogenesis. And this will be the scenario in probably about 70% of male cancer patients that they may be infertile for a period of time, but eventually they will recover uh, normal spermatogenesis, or at least some spermatogenesis. Uh, but our interest is in that 30% of patients where the stem cell pool is completely depleted and spermatogenesis never recovers. And we feel like we accomplished that goal uh, with the yellow and the blue lines, the higher doses of uh, alkylating chemotherapy, which caused sperm counts to go to zero and remain at zero for more than a year's period of time. So in that model, then, we asked whether it would be possible to thaw out the testicular cells that we had frozen for those uh, animals and inject them back into the same animal to regenerate autologous spermatogenesis. Now, unlike the mouse examples that you saw yesterday, we don't have the benefit of using a green fluorescent monkey or a monkey that expresses the lax Z transgene and can be stained blue. So rather what we did is we marked the frozen and thawed cells with a lentivirus comparing the GFP gene. And the idea was that if that animal ever produced green sperm, then those sperm had to come from the cells that were frozen and thawed and transplanted. It turned out that that was kind of naive, and uh, I knew that the day when Brian came into the office and said, Kyle, you won't believe it, but we've got green sperm. And so I told him he was right, I didn't believe it. And as we started walking over to the laboratory, I asked him how many of the sperm were green. And he said, well, all of them are green. And in fact, he showed me the samples, and all the sperm were green, and the control were not green, and so it looked pretty impressive. But we knew it was impossible, actually, because our efficiency of marking with a lentivirus, the spermatogonial stem cells, is extraordinarily low, probably about 0.5%. So 100% green sperm wasn't possible. And what we learned is that a lot of times monkey sperm glow, gre glow green anyway. <laughs> well, this was not a problem uh, because the lentivirus actually integrates its genome into the host genome, and so we can simply use PCR to identify um, sperm that came from cells that were frozen and thawed and transplanted. So we'll get back to that later, but then the question was, how do we introduce those cells into the testis? And what I'm showing you here on the left is what uh, transplantation looks like in a mouse. And in the mouse, we access the testis by making an incision in the abdomen, and we pull the testis out on the belly. And if you look down through um, a dissecting microscope, uh, you can see uh, the, the testis here. Here's the efferent ducts that are going to the epididymis, but the important thing in, in rodents is that the reedy testis, where all the seminiferous tubules uh, meet, is right here. You can see it on the surface. So when you take this approach and you stick the needle in, you know when the tip of your needle is in the correct spot, and when you apply pressure, you can see all the tubules fill up at the same time. There's a blue dye here that allows us to see that. But that scenario is less practical in uh, higher primates, including non-human primate and human, and that's because even though urologists will tell you that oftentimes they access the head of the epididymis or the efferent duct, it would be possible to visualize when the tip of the needle comes out into the reedy testis because in the human testis, the reedy testis is internal. It's not, it's not on the surface. So rather, we borrowed on a technique that had been described by several other researchers, including Ina Dobrinsky and Stefan Schlatt, uh, in large animals, and that's ultrasound-guided reedy testis injection. So what you're looking at here is an ultrasound image of a testis. Uh, the ultrasound probe is here. Uh, but what's important that I want to point out to you is that the reedy testis is easy to visualize because it makes this echo-dense white line. And so that's something that we can target under ultrasound guidance. And that's what I'm showing you here. So this is a 25-gauge needle. This is not a surgical procedure. Uh, the needle is simply inserted through the base of the scrotum until the tip of the needle comes out into the reedy testis space. Uh, now, uh, although we put blue dye in the cell suspension, you wouldn't be able to see it on ultrasound, so what we also added to the cell suspension were little microbubbles that we can see on ultrasound. So when we apply pressure, uh, the first thing you'll see is that the reedy testis fills up. That's what you see there. And then as we let this thing run, you'll be able to see that the seminiferous tubules all fill up out of the reedy testis space. Can you see that? So the nice thing about this is that we can confirm at the time that we do the injection that the cell suspension went into the right place. Uh, if the little bubbles don't go into the right space, then we simply adjust the needle until uh, we do get this outcome. And this is really a, quite a simple procedure. Uh, when I walk into the room, if the monkey's already on the table, somebody hands me an ultrasound probe in one hand and the needle in the other hand, 
I don't even push the plunger. Somebody else does that. So uh, in about five minutes, I can have one testis done, and by 15 minutes, I can have both testes of the same animal done. Well, this is the result from one of the autologous uh, transplants where you can see that this animal was making, you'll have to trust me, normal levels of sperm uh, before chemotherapy. The chemotherapy was given here, and about 10 weeks later, the sperm counts went to zero, which is what we always can expect to happen. So at that point, we transplanted that animal's own stem cells back into his testis, and what you can see is that 30 weeks later, sperm counts began to recover. And we know that at least some of those sperm came from the cells that were frozen and thawed and transplanted because the PCR down here shows us a band indicating the lentivirus GFP uh, transgene. So uh, I hope I've convinced you that we can do stem cell transplant in a monkey model of a cancer survivor and that we can regenerate spermatogenesis from frozen and thawed uh, stem cells. We think that at least technically this will be feasible in humans because what I'm showing you here are the, re are the te ultrasound images of two teenage boys where I hope you can appreciate that the Reedy testis is easy to visualize and I imagine that we can access that space the same way that we do in the monkeys. So uh, in my opinion, uh, spermatogonial stem cell transplantation is ready for the clinic today. Um, and that's not as startling as it might seem because what most people don't know is that spermatogonial stem cell transplantation was already done in the UK all the way back uh, in circa 2000. And this was for 12 uh, Hodgkin's patients who had their testicular tissues, actually testicular <coughs> cell suspensions cryopreserved. And then in the following years, seven of those patients had their cells transplanted back into their testes. That's actually quite, quite extraordinary because at that time, stem cell transplantation hadn't been demonstrated in any, any species except for a mouse and a rat. So this was uh, really revolutionary at the time and maybe, maybe before its time. But I think the thing that it tells you is that fertility was important enough to these men that they were willing to undergo an experimental therapy uh, that only had ever been proven in a mouse and a rat in those days. And also, even though there's been no follow-up reports, as far as we know, nothing bad happened. Now, somebody challenged me before and said, well, if there are no follow-up reports, how do you know nothing bad happened? Which I thought was a reasonable question. So I reached out to Richard Shallot, who was the PI on that particular study, and asked him about it. And he's retired now, but it turns out that the nurse that was there at the time is still on the floor, and so she followed up. And as far as they can ascertain, there were no adverse outcomes associated with those injections. The other reason why I think this technology is ready for the clinic is because this has been uh, recapitulated in mice and rats and hamsters and dogs and cats and goats and sheep and pigs and I just showed you monkeys. So it's hard to imagine a technology that's been vetted so rigorously over a 25 uh, year period of time uh, before it's arrived at the clinic. It appears to be a safe and a feasible technology. And also because our group and many others around the world have been freezing testicular tissues for patients for the past several years. We, I think that we owe it to them to responsibly uh, develop the next generation of technologies and bring them to the clinic. Otherwise, there's no point in us having done the surgery before therapy in the first place. So then that causes us to start thinking about who would be the ideal patients. And for me, uh, the ideal earliest patients would be bone marrow transplant patients. One, because the conditioning therapy that they get is some of the most toxic therapies that kids get, and they're almost certain to be infertile as a result of the treatment. But also, in this case, there's almost no chance, uh, as long as it's not a cancer patient, uh, there's no chance that we would reintroduce cancer cells. And so we take that risk off the table, at least for the initial uh, studies. And finally, uh, my opinion is that the best time to do a transplant would be during the teenage years because under the influence of hormones from the brain, this is the time when the testis is growing, which in principle means that the stem cell niches are actually proliferating, and that way when we transplant stem cells, the robustness of engraftment will be at its highest, and in fact, all of our data in animals suggest that that's the case. Okay, so for the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to describe another therapy, and that's autologous testicular tissue grafting. Um, this, again, is a technology that I think is relatively mature and maybe not quite as close to the clinic as stem cell transplantation, but I think it's getting there. I'll show you why. So again, we used our non-human primate model of cancer survivorship, uh, where we cryopreserved, in this case, testicular tissue pieces, because we're going to do a t tissue based therapy. Uh, again, we used chemotherapy to wipe out endogenous spermatogenesis. Uh, 
Uh, before I launch into this story, I want to show you from a molecular view what uh, spermatogenesis looks like in an adult monkey. So what you're looking at here is a seminiferous tubule of the testis with multiple layers of germ cells, which are shown in red, and also acrosin-positive postmeiotic germ cells, so that indicates complete spermatogenesis. So this is the outcome that we're trying to achieve. But when we collect the biopsy material from a prepubertal monkey, what we see is something that looks like this. Uh, you still see the seminiferous tubules, and you see uh, infrequent numbers of red vasopositive cells, but we never see acrosin-positive postmeiotic cells because these are immature tissues. And those are the tissues that we autologously grafted back into the monkeys from which we got them. And the experimental design looked like this. So we grafted tissues either under the back skin or under the scrotal skin. Uh, we grafted both fresh tissues, sorry, frozen tissues and uh, fresh tissues. So we collected another biopsy right before we started the procedure. And, um, and then we put uh, four tissues per site, as you see in the middle panel here. So we just made a little uh, loop of suture and connected the tissue to the underside of the skin, put four tissues per site. And this experimental design allowed us to ask questions about um, the efficacy of using fresh versus frozen tissue, whether the site's important, back, back versus scrotum. And we also added matrigel to some of the sites because we thought that might stimulate angiogenesis. Now, important to note, a little caveat, is that these monkeys were all castrated, so they had no testes. And the reason that we did that is because every instance that's been described over the past 15 years of testicular tissue grafting where, function, sorry, where sperm have been produced has been in animals that were castrated. Nobody knows if that's necessary, but I had five monkeys available for this procedure at a uh, fairly high cost, and we wanted to use what we thought might be the most likely to succeed, and so that's what we did. Well, our first sign that the grafts were working okay is that we began to see testosterone production. Now, the, these, uh, this grafting was done right at the time of puberty, so we were beginning to see signs of the beginning of puberty in the animals. We put the grafts in at that time, and you can see that uh, relatively quickly those grafts began responding to hormones from the brain and producing testosterone. So that was encouraging. And when we went to look at the animals, we actually could watch the grafts grow, both on the back uh, and in the scrotum. I particularly like the scrotum ones because those look like little nuts, and I can't imagine a better place to grow spermatogenesis than actually in the scrotum where spermatogenesis normally occurs. Regarding the experimental design, it really didn't matter whether we used fresh tissue or frozen tissue, whether we put it on the back or in the scrotum, and whether we added matrigel or not. In all cases, the grafts grew. And when we recovered the grafts, Initially, I was actually pretty disappointed because uh, although these grafts grew, they looked very fibrotic to me. Actually, the tissues were quite tough, and as you know, a testicular tissue is not quite tough. It's actually quite soft. So this was discouraging to me. Um, but when we tore the tissue apart and also did histology, I hope what you can appreciate is that compared to what we started with in an immature tissue, now we have a tissue with a multiple layers of vasopositive germ cells, a nice lumen in the center of the seminiferous tubule, and also acrosin positive postmeiotic cells. And when we, pour the, when we tore the tissues apart, we could find examples of normal looking sperm. Well, I don't know what a normal looking human sperm is, but y'all can comment on, on that. Um, and we were able actually from every graft to recover on the order of thousands to even millions of sperm. So these weren't rare events, actually, we were able to recover quite a bit of sperm. So the next most obvious question for us is, are those sperm functional and could they first fertilize an egg? So we sent those sperm off to our collaborators at the Oregon National Primate Research Center who performed intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Uh, we were able to get nice embryo development to the hatching blastocyst stage. Uh, so we did an embryo transfer uh, last November. Pregnancy was confirmed by ultrasound a month later. And then when we did a follow-up ultrasound in January, we could ascertain that development was normal. Again, I don't know what normal is, but the ultrasound person told me that that's normal. So at that time, we uh, scheduled the cesarean section uh, for April 16th. And the result was this little baby, little baby girl named Grady, which stands for graft-derived baby. And this is the world's first baby born from autologously, autologously grafted, frozen and thawed testicular tissue. Now, uh, grafting is a, is a procedure, actually, like I said, that's been performed for, for many years, including with the production of sperm and even babies, but the frozen and thawed aspect is particularly important to our patient population because, of course, we're going to have to freeze the tissues of the young boys for some period of time 
before uh, uh, it'll be used for reproductive purposes. Okay. So uh, regarding the testicular tissue grafting, um, the developmental assessments of Grady are ongoing. So we have three and six month assessments. And as far as we can tell, uh, her behaviors and her play activities and et cetera are normal for a baby of her age. Uh, she's in a cage with uh, three animals of the same age too. So uh, we can ascertain her development compared to other animals that weren't manipulated. Um, we need to repeat this uh, experiment in animals that actually have testes. We, we did this in castrated animals for the reason that I said, but of course we're not going to castrate uh, a young cancer patient. And so we need to make sure that this will work in an intact uh, patient. And finally, we need to repeat the, uh, the procedure with human tissues, and I think that we should be able to do that by xenografting human tissues either into monkeys and or into mice. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I've already given you conclusions to the, t the cell-based and the tissue-based therapy, but a broader view for fertility preservation, I think it's important to understand that this is a multidisciplinary effort. This isn't something that I could have done by myself. The oncologist could not have done it by themselves. The reproductive doctors could not have done it by themselves. But by communicating with each other, we're able to bring fertility preservation to the patients in a timely manner, sometimes in a very compressed time frame between diagnosis and treatment. So I'll finish up there. I put red boxes around the people that contributed. Uh, Brian Herman, who's in the audience, was the driver of the spermatogonial stem cell transplantation study. Uh, Adetunji Fiomi, who also is an alumnus of the laboratory and now a postdoc, um, did the testicular tissue grafting. Um, the Karen and Sarah and Hannah are the ones who actually recruit and counsel our patients and schedule their procedures. And of course, we couldn't have done the fertilization experiments without our collaborators uh, in Oregon and people who are experts at testicular tissue grafting. So with that, I thank you for your attention.